Summary of the Wager, A Tale of Shipwreck, Mutiny and Murder Written by David Grant, Chapter 1. In the bitter cold of January 1740, a squadron of British warships, set against the tumultuous backdrop of the War of Jenkins Ear, was poised for a perilous mission. The air was thick with the burdensome stories of each man aboard the squadron, like echoes of unresolved lives carried alongside sea chests. Among them was David Cheap, the first lieutenant of the flagship Centurion, a man in his early forties with a protracted nose, intense eyes, and a turbulent past. Cheap's journey to the sea was a flight from the entanglements of life on land quarrels with his brother over inheritance, relentless creditors, and the shackles of debts that stood as barriers to securing a suitable bride. On shore, he seemed destined for a life marred by unexpected challenges, yet, perched on the quarter deck of the Centurion, he found solace in the wooden world of a ship a world dictated by navy regulations, the laws of the sea, and the unyielding fellowship of men. The squadron's flagship, the Centurion, was a formidable vessel with a hull stretching 144 feet long and 40 feet wide. The bustling dockyard in Portsmouth, along the English Channel, became the stage for a frenetic race against time. Carpenters, cockers, riggers, and joiners swarmed over the decks resembling rats scurrying amidst a cacophony of hammers and saws. Cheap, in his cocked hat and with a spyglass in hand, watched with impatience as the wooden behemoth, moored at the slip, underwent the necessary repairs and preparations. It was January 1740, and the British Empire was gearing up for war against its imperial rival, Spain. The captain of the Centurion, George Anson, had been unexpectedly elevated to the rank of Commodore by the Admiralty to lead the squadron of Five warships against the Spanish. Anson, a tall and inscrutable figure with a penchant for silence, had spent nearly three decades in the Navy without leading a significant military campaign or securing a lucrative prize. Anson's promotion had set the stage for Cheap, his right-hand man, to rise to the coveted position of captain. The wooden world of the ship offered Cheap not just refuge but also a crystalline order and a clarity of purpose. His flight from the troubles on land had found sanctuary amidst the rigidity of navy, regulations and the disciplined camaraderie of seafaring men. The urgency of war, however, collided with the harsh realities of ship preparation, the Centurion, along with the squadron's other vessels the Gloucester, the Pearl, and the Severn was marooned at the dockyard in England. Struggling with feverish futility to be fitted out for the impending mission, the war with Spain had broken out, and the squadron faced the challenges of plagues, drowning and the looming threat of enemy cannon fire, as the days ticked by, Cheap's frustration grew. The wooden world that had promised refuge now felt confining as the squadron faced delays in ship. Repairs, the wooden hull, though sturdy, bore the scars of sea life woodworm riddled sheathing, a rotten foremast cavity, and rat-eaten sails. Each ship was a complex orchestration of wood, canvas, and hemp, vulnerable to the destructive forces of the sea. The narrative painted a vivid picture of the chaos at the royal dockyards among the largest manufacturing sites globally. Overwhelmed with ships in various states of disrepair, the wooden behemoths, crafted from simple yet perishable materials, required extensive maintenance after each voyage, a Herculean task exacerbated by the wartime chaos. The squadron faced an additional challenge in assembling a crew for the extended expedition, with conscription not in practice. The shortage of crews rendered a third of the Navy's ships unusable. Robert Walpole, the first prime minister, lamented the dearth of sailors, crying, oh, seamen, 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 cheap, along with other officers, scrounged for sailors, only to find that the recruited men were falling prey to an epidemic of typhus, typhus, transmitted by lice and vermin, became a formidable enemy before the squadron even set sail. The sick were rushed to a makeshift hospital in Gosport, near Portsmouth, but the overcrowded facility became a breeding ground for disease. The squadron, desperate for manpower, was caught in a race against time. A race complicated by the relentless outbreak of ship's fever, amidst the chaos. The narrative introduced Captain Dandy Kidd, in charge of the wager, a ship undergoing a radical transformation from an East Diamond to a man of war. Kidd, superstitious and haunted by ominous portents, struggled with the transformation of his ship and the foreboding signs he interpreted in the winds. And waves, the wager, a merchant vessel turned warship, faced additional challenges including a freezing Thames River that imprisoned the ship for two months. The naval drama unfolded against the backdrop of England's coldest winter on record, adding to the complexity of preparing the squadron for its ambitious mission. As May arrived, the squadron, 
including the newly transformed Wager, finally emerged from the dockyards, the ships, now classified by their number of cannons, faced the challenge of assembling crews double their usual complement. Sheep's optimism wavered as he witnessed the toll of typhus on the recruited men, a stark reminder of the perilous journey awaiting them. The squadron, with the Centurion as its flagship, was nearing readiness, but the desperate need for crew members and the looming threat of typhus cast a shadow over their impending expedition. The wooden world of the ship, once a sanctuary for cheap, now mirrored the unpredictability and challenges of the vast oceans they were about to navigate. The narrative set the stage for an epic maritime adventure, entwining personal stories, leadership dynamics, and the broader canvas of geopolitical conflict. As the wooden world of the ship became both haven and crucible, the characters prepared to embark on a journey that would test their mettle and reshape their destinies on the unforgiving seas. Chapter 2 John Byron found himself abruptly woken from sleep by the cacophonous cries of the boatswain and his mates on the wager, summoning the morning watch, as the midshipman, a mere sixteen years old, stirred from his berth in the bowels of the ship. The darkness outside prevented him from discerning whether it was day or night. His living quarters were far from luxurious, nestled below the quarter deck, below the upper deck, and even below the lower deck where ordinary sailors slept in their swinging hammocks. Byron's abode was situated in the aft part of the Orlop Decadank, airless hold devoid of natural light. The only thing below him was the ship's hold, where dirty bilge water pulled, its unpleasant scent wafting upwards and infiltrating Byron's sleeping quarters. Such conditions were the stark reality for a midshipman on the wager, as he tried to acclimate to the challenging environment of naval life. The height of the Orlop deck barely exceeded five feet. Demanding that Byron constantly ducked while standing to avoid collisions with the overhead beams, his space, along with other young midshipmen, was limited to a width of 21 inches, where they slung their hammocks. The close quarters meant that elbows and knees often jostled with neighboring sleepers, though an upgrade from the meager space allotted to ordinary seamen, it still reflected the hierarchy enforced on board, where one's place in the pecking order was determined by where they laid their head, within this oaken vault. Byron and his companions stored their few possessions in sea chest wooden trunks that served as repositories for the entirety of their belongings during the voyage. These chests doubled as makeshift furniture on board, acting as chairs, card tables, and desks. The atmosphere in the midshipman's berth, as described by a novelist, was cluttered with soiled clothing, plates, glasses, books, hats, dirty stockings, tooth combs, and even pets like white mice and cage parrots. Yet, Amidst the chaos, a wooden table served as a totem a table long enough for a body to lie on. This was not a luxury but a practical necessity, as it doubled as the surgeon's operating room when the need arose. It was a stark reminder of the imminent dangers that lay ahead, as once the wager entered battle, the midshipman's home would be filled with bone saws and the scent of blood. The boatswain and his mates, the town criers of the ship, continued their morning routine with relentless cries and whistles, lanterns in hand. They moved through the decks, leaning over sleeping seamen, bellowing, out or down, out or down. The consequences for non-compliance were severe hammocks would be cut free, sending bodies crashing onto the deck. Byron, aware of the boatswain's reputation as a notorious bruiser, quickly rose, knowing better than to provoke such a figure. As Byron hurriedly dressed in the dim light, his aristocratic background came to the forefront. Born into one of the oldest lines in England, his ancestry could be traced back to the Norman conquest. His father, the fourth Lord Byron, had passed away, leaving John as the younger son of a nobleman and honorable gentleman in the parlance of the time. The vast contrast between the wager's cramped and dimly lit quarters and the grandeur of Newstead Abbey, the family estate surrounded by Sherwood Forest, was palpable. The wager, a far cry from the Abbey's breathtaking castle, marked the beginning of a journey that seemed to stretch the limits of his noble lineage. Two years before the wager set sail on its expedition, young John Byron, then only fourteen, departed from the elite Westminster School and volunteered for the Navy. His decision was partly influenced by his older brother William inheriting the family estate, along with a proclivity for eccentricities that led to the squandering of the family fortune, reducing Newstead Abbey to ruins. William, nicknamed the Wicked Lord, staged fake naval battles and engaged in fatal sword duels embodying the erratic nature that plagued the Byron family. Left with few means to earn a respectable living, John faced limited options. While he could enter the church or serve in the army, the allure of the navy, 
despite its reputation for demanding physical labor, captivated him. Samuel Pepys had, in 1676, implemented policies encouraging privileged youths to apprentice on warships for at least six years, with the promise of a commission as an officer in the Royal Navy upon passing an oral examination. Byron, enraptured by the sea's mystique and inspired by tales of maritime exploits, brought books about sailors with him on board the stories of Sir Francis Drake stashed in his sea chest. Despite the enticements, a naval career was viewed as somewhat unseemly for someone of Byron's pedigree, Samuel Johnson, who knew the Byron family, deemed it a perversion. Yet, the young midshipman was fascinated by the sea and willingly embraced a life that demanded hard work and dirty hands, in stark contrast to the idleness associated with the army. The passage introduces the complex social structure on board the wager, while poor and pressed sailors receive basic clothing, known as slops. To counter the unwholesome smells and beastliness, there were no official uniforms yet. Byron's aristocratic outfits, with lace and silk, had to conform to shipboard demands, emphasizing practicality over luxury. The passage paints a detailed portrait of Byron, describing him as irresistibly handsome, with pale, luminous skin, large brown eyes, and ringlets of hair. As Byron emerged onto the quarterdeck, he assumed his position among the crew members who had been divided into two alternating watch parties. The ship, a leviathan that never slept and was constantly in motion, required coordination and precision. Byron, as a midshipman, played a multifaceted role trimming sails, carrying officers' messages, and participating in the myriad tasks that kept the ship operational. The hierarchy on the ship was emphasized, with Captain Kidd at the pinnacle of authority at sea. The captain wielded more power than the king himself, with the ability to order men into battle, holding the power of life and death over everyone on board. The second in command, Lieutenant Robert Baines, presented a contrasting figure known for his indecisiveness despite hailing from a notable family. The crew, diverse in backgrounds and professions, formed distinct units based on their roles. Sailmakers, armorers, carpenters, and surgeons had their specialized tasks contributing to the seamless functioning of the ship. The seamen were divided into divisions based on their skills, from agile topmen at the mastheads to wasters performing unskilled labor alongside livestock. The Marines, soldiers from the army, held a unique position. Subject to naval authority while commanded by army officers, the narrative delves into the social dynamics among the crew, highlighting the coalescence of diverse individuals into a band of brothers, as Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson termed it. However, the wager faced challenges with an unusual number of unwilling and troublesome crew members, including the menacing carpenter's mate James Mitchell. Byron, still navigating his newfound environment, couldn't yet fathom the true nature of his fellow seamen or even himself a revelation that awaited the uncertainties of the long and dangerous voyage. Byron's aristocratic background, the contrast between his familial estate and the cramped quarters of the wager, and the societal expectations placed upon him set the stage for a compelling narrative. The passage skillfully weaves together historical context, personal anecdotes, and the intricate details of naval life in the 18th century, promising a story rich in maritime adventure, personal growth, and the challenges of social hierarchy.